back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Eric Hoyt. Uh, Eric is the Call per- Family Professor of Media Production uh, and a professor of film, media, and cultural studies in the Department of Communication Arts at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his teaching and research concentrate on digital media production, uh, the, the digital humanities, media industries, and the histories of American film and broadcasting. And the reason uh, we have him on the show today is he has a new book out, Ink Stained Hollywood, The Triumph of American Cinema's Trade Press, uh, published by University of California Press. It's out now. You can you can read it for free on your Kindle. That's that's actually how I got it. Uh, instead of a you know standard advanced reading copy, I was able to get it on my Kindle, and you can do the same. It's not just for us fancy media folks. Uh, Eric, thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I I I, I love this book for a couple of reasons. One, it reminded me of being an undergrad. Uh, because this is very much an, it is an academic book. I just want to, you know, uh, give people a slight heads up. It is, it is, it is an academic book, but it's a very readable academic book. I mean, that is in the highest praise possible. Yeah, I take uh, that as a great compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but it is, uh, it is, it is, it's an academic book, and it's, it's an interesting one for me because it, it, uh, the thing I love about reading academic books about uh, subjects from the past is how, how they always echo things that we are always arguing about now in the present so in this in this interview we'll talk a little bit about that but why don't you just set the stage for us what was what was your uh, goal in writing this book what what was your research uh hoping to hoping to accomplish as you looked back at some of these early hollywood trade press publications yeah thanks sunny um this book really emerged out of a couple of very different experiences that uh i've, I've had in my professional life one of which has been working over the last decade to digitize millions of pages of old Hollywood fan magazines and trade papers. And these are the collections that you can find at the Media History Digital Library, mediahistoryproject.org. Um, it's a project that was founded by David Pierce. Um, and we built the first website in 2011 and um, 2017. Uh, David shifted to a new set of responsibilities at the the Library of Congress over at the Packard Center for Audiovisual Conservation. Uh, And I started to lead the the, um, project myself at the University of Wisconsin. And so it's a project where uh, I had the opportunity to be involved with almost every stage uh, of this digitization work, from doing some scanning to lots of metadata entry and coordination and fundraising uh, and then building platforms like our search engine lantern that people can use to search through uh, these old Hollywood trade papers that film and broadcasting historians use all the time because they're great sources. Uh, it was just striking to me that there were so many of these trade papers, right? Like for uh, a, a, an industry that wasn't even as large as, as something like uh, steel or the automotive industry uh, or any number of others, you had, um, you know, at, at one point over a dozen national trade papers covering the film industry. You'd have regional trade papers geared toward exhibitors. You'd have some very specialized trade papers for the, the production community. Um, and I was very interested in, in why that was. And then as I was reading through these two, I, I recalled another experience, and this is something I, I talk about in the introduction, which is that before I went down this academic track that I'm on now, my first job out of college was working uh, in a Hollywood uh, talent agency mailroom. So I, I was uh, working in the mailroom and I would show up to work every day in, in Beverly Hills uh, at seven in the morning and deliver trades to the, um, at that time it was Daily Variety and, and Hollywood Reporter, the paper copies to the, the desks of the agents. Um, and I started to read those trade papers too. I read them for news. Um, but I also absorbed the community and kind of seen around me in the sense that um, people would read these trade papers critically. You know, like uh, talent agents know that a lot of these are, are planted by publicists. Um, but at the same time, they could invest a, a lot of meaning in, in these trade papers, too. You know, there were various rankings of kind of who's hot and who are movers and shakers in the industry. And there were definitely uh, hurt feelings when people were, were left out. And so uh, as I looked at these trade papers from the, the past, um, I also really tried to think about it in terms of that um, 
kind of whole set of different lenses that I had acquired myself uh, in, during my brief foray in, in to, to show business. In other words, these are, yes, um, sources of news and information, but they're also very important to the culture of the, the film industry and, and, and Hollywood and how it works. And they're read with um, a critical eye by the participants with the industry, um, but who also recognize that it's meaningful what's what's said here uh, in, in these um, particular forums. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was interesting reading uh, your book because in the in the early days in the in the you know, back in the the early 1900s. Uh, before film becomes the dominant medium, uh, and obviously way before TV, um, uh, you, you, you many of these publications were not only were were not for film; they were for vaudeville, they were for theatrical um, uh, uh, theaters, theater, like actual live theater, legitimate theater, as <laughs> legitimate theater, as they as you would you would say. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, it was it was funny because it called to mind something that I I, I saw recently reading the book Nightmare Alley. Um, which has like a couple sequences where guys are actually looking at ads in variety for for vaudeville shows. So how did how did that evolution happen? And what was the uh, was the cart leading the horse here? You know, did did they shift to a, a film focus because film grew in stature or was was there more advertising that led to a greater focus on film? How did that kind of work as these uh, newspapers evolved? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about Variety, which is definitely the best known of all the entertainment industry trade papers. Um, but it, it's also unique in a number of ways, too. So even as I, I, I say this, um, everything I say is, is going to be true to the best of my knowledge about Variety, but it's not representative of the field as a whole. Um, Variety uh, was founded in 1905 um, by Syme Silverman, who was the publisher and editor for the first almost 30 years of the paper's run. And as you were saying, Sonny, it was very much uh, initially founded as a vaudeville publication, but it expanded its, its scope into the legitimate stage, into movies, which um, were exhibited within vaudeville acts. And then during the Nickelodeon boom in the 1906 to 1907, kind of took on uh, greater importance. But Variety was trying to cover the, the whole field. Uh, it would do it with its um, kind of very independent or orientation. I mean, that became Variety's real selling point early on was this perception that uh, unlike some of its competitors that covered the vaudeville industry, um, papers such as the New York Clipper um, or, and uh, Morning Telegraph, a Variety could not be bought by Keith and Albie and, and Orpheum and the other um, big time uh, vaudeville managers and chains. And so Variety maintained its independence, Variety would pan more acts and, you know, movies than its competitors uh, would as well, and they would point to this. Um, uh, vaudeville um, declines uh, big time in the, the 1920s, um, even in the early 20s, before the introduction of movie sound, Vaudeville is on the decline, and then especially after uh, sound is, is introduced and take, uh, taken up in the movies over that period from really kind of 1926 to 1930, um, straight vaudeville is, is is pretty much gone as an industry. And you, you get, you know, small flavorings and sprinklings of it in different ways. Um, but, but Variety was, was really strategically savvy. In the 1920s, what they did was they leveraged that earlier reputation for, for being independent uh, and really marketed it toward the movie industry um, and encouraged... Uh, the movie studios and producers to buy ads. Um, they increased their coverage of the industry um, and and did well, especially again during that transition to sound when, um, you know, like that's such a period of all these different entertainment industries coming together. You have uh, music and recording. You have lots of vaudeville acts that are now being recorded for film. And so that emphasis on variety um, uh, helped them then. And the 1920s are also when Variety became known as a boffo paper, uh, or it became known for its its language mm -hmm. uh, and, and great use of language. There was a, an American Mercury article about this very thing. And, and um, I think it was in 1926 that Hugh Kent 
wrote an essay in the American Mercury just gushing over variety. Um, and this is a magazine that was written for, um, you know, the H.L. Mencken crowd, um, modernists and and modernists in America who kind of detested um, hokum and and uh, what they looked at as sentimental entertainment, and they really liked variety style and its its use of slang. And so, yeah, all those things came together uh, really in the 1920s for Variety, and then it was in 33 that Variety opened um, its daily trade paper on the West Coast, Daily Variety. Mm-hmm. You mentioned it's. You mentioned Mencken. I'm going to come back to him because I think there, mm-hmm. there's a, there's an interesting uh, kind of uh, digression in in your book about the uh, the the varying critical theories um, that that these papers kind of kind of assumed. Um, but we'll 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 get back to that in one second. I, one thing I want to hit on that you mentioned was different different audiences for different papers, because I think this is one of the most interesting uh, parts of the book, and and one of the most interesting ways that the trade papers evolved was because look here's here's an industry where you had you have exhibitors who have their own issues, you have film studios that have their own issues, um, you have talent which has their own goals and 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 issues. And at one point, there was a, uh, a a guy whose name escapes me. He's one of the main, but he, he was trying to consolidate the whole industry. Mm-hmm. Martin Quigley. Martin yeah. Quigley, thank you. Uh, and and Quigley, you know, didn't seem to quite understand that all of these competing interests had their own uh, goals and hopes and wanted to see themselves represented in ways that were not... Uh, necessarily conducive for an a, a, an industry standard publication, right? Yeah, yeah. You just described that really well, and probably far more succinctly than than I can. Yeah, I mean that's a, a major um, theme and 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 thread throughout the book is the fact that as much as we think of the motion picture industry as being one thing, uh, as as you just said, it's really um, made up of these different sectors. Of the industry, and those sectors within the industry have their own communities of workers and participants that are part of it, uh, and most of them, you know, see themselves as being the center of the whole movie universe. You know, that they um, and and what they want are papers that they feel like can represent them and their interests. And so, um, in the book, I have a chapter that focuses in on exhibitor trade papers, and especially kind of specialized regional exhibitor trade papers. So things written for the exhibitors in the Kansas City area, or Chicago area, um, a paper called Harrison's Reports that really started as a newsletter. And what distinguished Harrison's Reports, um, and it was at the top of every single issue, is that it was um, published free from the influence of film advertising. And so Harrison would not take any ads from the studios, he had to charge a much higher subscription rate um, to his customers because it wasn't advertising subsidized. But for a certain sector of those exhibitors, they they were willing to pay it and really trusted him precisely because they felt like they could not trust the, the trade papers that were running so many ads from the studios. Um, and like you said, Sonny, uh, it also comes up in really interesting ways uh, when it comes to the, the trade papers published in Los Angeles that are focused on the production community there. Because the um, the issues that that concern them and, and animate them, uh, as you can imagine, are quite different from the you know the, the Omaha, Nebraska uh, exhibitor um, in terms of what they're really fired up and care about. Yeah how how did uh, the the nascent labor movement uh, kind of interact with the trade publications? I there there's kind of an interesting symbiosis here between you know folks. Uh, in the, the Writers Guild or, you know, the, the burgeoning Screen Actors Guild who uh, found their own champions in the, the press. Yeah, yeah, that was something that, that really stood out to me during my research. And it, and it comes up in a, at a couple of different moments that one of, it turns out, the best ways for a trade paper editor, especially one based in L.A., to really grow their circulation is to firmly take the side of um, the creative community uh, and the directors and writers and directors of Hollywood when there's some kind of um, budgetary dispute or kind of widespread industry uh, dispute. And it, it came up even be the, before the formation of the Hollywood unions in, in the 1920s and 1927, 
there was a, a, a big debate going on within the industry about the budget levels of movies and the, the very young Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences was kind of trying to be a mediator within that. And, um, you know, a number of the trade papers kind of took the side of the studios or just tried to, you know, be like a, a very kind of neutral approach. Um, but that was not the approach taken by Welford Beaton, who had a, a trade paper called The Film Spectator. And he really firmly took the side of talent, um, you know, basically saying like, hey, it's the writers and directors that make these works that people want to see. And meanwhile, there's tons of waste that's happening on the producer and studio side. So, you know, don't blame uh, the writer's salary for the the, the problems of the industry. Um, and uh, the the paper, this, this paper, Film Spe- Spectator, which before that had been mostly kind of like craft-oriented criticism, I would call it, like mostly just, you know, his um, perspective on how movies and movie making can, can be better from an aesthetic and craft standpoint, but it, it booms in circulation. Everyone wants to read this. Uh, it's a paper that only comes out once every two weeks. So it's not like uh, the writers and directors and actors within the industry were reading it to get the, the very latest news about the dispute. You know, they, they go other places to get that news faster. Um, but what they really appreciated was uh, this, you know, really forceful, witty voice that was, you know, speaking for them um, and affirming uh, their view of the industry and taking their side. And they, they loved um, him for it. And a similar dynamic emerges in the, the early 30s with Hollywood Reporter, where um, the, the publisher of Hollywood Reporter, Billy Wilkerson, took the side of I would say I would say he took the side of the LA production community. The way that um, Wilkerson framed it was really to distinguish between the people like himself who were based in LA, um, and he was willing to include studio, you know, some studio executives like Daryl F. Zanuck uh, or Irving Thalberg, you know, production managers who really understand the movie making process and who were also, in many cases, his his friends. Um, that they and the writers and actors um, were in the right, and he would call out people like William Fox and Will Hayes, who were based in New York, as being just totally out of touch. Um, and he managed to, to also quite successfully really grow the circulation of, of Hollywood Reporter by, um, by taking that stand and by um, making that particular community feel like he had their back. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned uh, Welford Beaton and Film Spectator, and I want to I want to come back to him because there's there's a very funny bit in the book where you talk about his uh, essentially holy war against the close up. Like <laughs> yes, the actual like the actual film shot the close up. He's he's tired of seeing close ups in movies. Medium shots that gets you everything you need. You don't need to keep focusing in on people's faces. But it but there there's an interesting kind of thread running throughout this, uh, in, in which the the trade publications serve uh they they have crit they employ critics who serve an actual commercial function here and and it's it's different from how we think of criticism today i think it's different from service journalism right where where folks are saying you know thumbs up thumbs down you should go see this or you should not see this it's different from the war against the close-ups aside it's it's most it's largely different from you know kind of more esoteric art art criticism right it it was focused largely on helping the exhibitors figure out what to book and the producers what to produce right yeah that's that that's a huge component of it and and like we were talking about before it's really useful to think about who the audiences were and and welford beaton with the film spectator um knew that some of the readers were practitioners working in hollywood and he wanted to let them know you're using too many close-ups. <laughs> yeah, like the, you're you're over relying on this one particular shot. Um, you know, let's like realize there's a larger vocabulary of cinema, and then, you know, as the old saying goes, hold hold your close-up for when it, it really counts. Um, uh, but like you said too, Sonny, there's there's a big component of these trade papers where there's they need to. Um, uh, perform a reviewing function for for exhibitors, like what um, what they should consider booking, um, what to watch out for, and th- and that's where 
you do see a, a level of mistrust that that I think is understandable, right? Like when you open a 1918 issue of Motion Picture News and you see that this uh, you know 150 page issue is like 75 pages just of advertising, and then you see the reviews for some of those same films. You know, if you're the exhibitor, you might justifiably wonder if the the reviewer is pulling his punches and that's where some of these specialized journals come into the mix like harrison's reports which i mentioned uh you also get sections within some of the trade papers that are reviews written by exhibitors and and so the most famous one of these sections is uh the what the picture did for me section um which started in a a magazine called metography uh, and then uh, Exhibitors Herald, Martin Quigley's paper, bought Metography, and eventually Exhibitors Herald, through some other um, acquisitions and mergers, became Motion Picture Herald. And for most of uh, its lifespan, that was one of the most popular se- um, sections, What the Picture Did for Me, where exhibitors from across the country um, could write in and say, you know, here's here's how the movie played. It made me money or it lost money. Uh, and you do see, the more you go through that section, you see there's certain exhibitors who keep writing in a lot. Like I found this one exhibitor from Idaho. He was working in a, a small town in Idaho that had less than 2,000 people in the town, but he would write in constantly. And uh, I mean, I think in in today's terminology, we would call him an influencer. Like he was he was uh, enormously influential. Um, people would read Philip Rand from, from Idaho's reviews. And even though his movie theater basically meant nothing in terms of the the revenues to the studios. He was actually kind of an important guy in the sense that uh, other movie theater owners looked closely at what he said and and sometimes made adjustments based on it. Well, let me ask, what what were some of the uh, the conflicts between big city movie theaters and, you know, kind of heartland uh, theaters in smaller towns? I know there's there were you at this point in time. Uh, certainly in the headed into the 1920s and 1930s there's a big technological shift from from silent pictures to talkies which necessitated a whole bunch of you know uh frankly costly upgrades to to the the uh theaters that some of these small town uh theaters couldn't really afford so what what were some of the conflicts there and how how did those play out in the the trades yeah, I mean, I think you can think of the conflicts and kind of being in, on two levels. Um, one level is taste and and kind of uh, how communities and audiences evaluate what they think is, is good or bad entertainment. Uh, but the other one very much has to do with ownership and industry structure. I mean, on, on the level of taste, there's um, certainly, and you get this reading through the, the papers, and, and it comes across very strongly in variety, this imagined um, bifurcation between sophisticated New York audiences who, you know, are used to going to like the legitimate stage and watching shows that uh, are dealing with more serious subjects, but also very likely have some risque and sexual material and sexual innuendo in them. Uh, And then on the other hand, those, you know, people out in the sticks uh, living in in the Midwest um, and other places with small towns who just want kind of hokum and uh, westerns and like these sentimental sappy stories? So there's there's very much that split and taste by the the, the 20s um, that you read a lot in the papers, and I think some of that is true. Um, but the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that by that point in the 1920s, the, Hollywood had really organized itself as this vertically integrated studio system led by you know a small group of firms and the the business model within that studio system was that those big vertically integrated companies like fox um warner brothers paramount you know really kind of the the architect of it all um they owned big theaters in the downtowns of cities uh, and those were given first run status and that's where movies would initially play the most expensive um Tickets were sold there, and so they used those first-run theaters as the, um, the the kind of the key to the distribution system to make as much money as possible. Because, in other words, they gave the the premier status to their movies that played um, in the downtown theaters in, in big cities, 
and then it would move across the country and um, you'd have subsequent run uh, theaters within cities. And then of course you'd have like lots of unaffiliated small town theaters. And so I, I see both of those kind of strands and strains running throughout this. In other words, yes, there's disagreements over individual movies and questions of, of taste, but there's also so much resentment on the part of independent exhibitors, small town exhibitors, that they're always in this subordinate position, that they get the movies later than, than the studio theaters, that they are forced into block booking contracts, you know, that say, well, if you want that one, you know, th theater that has uh, the star in it, the, this, this Mary Pickford picture, well, then you're going to have to take all these other movies along with it. And so there's, there's a lot of pushback on that level, too. Well, this is slightly beyond the scope of your book, but this all this all basically gets blown up b with the Paramount decrees, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, um, many of your listeners, I'm sure, know about that. But but um, if you don't, the Paramount decrees, Paramount decision that you're referring to, Sonny, is the 1948 uh, Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court sides with the Department of Justice. Um, and there'd been... I mean, basically like a 20 year lead up to this, that the, the Department of Justice in the early 30s launches an investigation into um, antitrust activities within the movie industry. Uh, they're looking very closely at block booking, um, uh, blind uh, selling or like, you know, exhibitors not being able to see the product they're buying as well as being locked into these contracts. Uh, they're also looking at ownership of theaters. Um, when World War II comes along, that whole investigation and the litigation around it essentially goes on pause. And there's this, you know, period of cooperation between the movie industry and the federal government in terms of um, producing entertainment and propaganda to, to support the American war effort, as well as using stars to sell war bonds. There's all kinds of really interesting collaboration and cooperative work that goes on during that period. And it's a hugely profitable period for Hollywood. I mean, th those were the best years Hollywood ever had, just from a business standpoint, were, were the war years, because on the home front, you had, you know, people coming out of the depression who had a lot of money in their pocket, but they didn't have all that much they could spend it on um, because of so many uh, shortages um, uh, d during that time. But yeah, right after World War II, the, the Department of Justice inve investigation got going again and the DOJ prevailed in the lower courts. And then when it reached the Supreme Court, they sided with the, the DOJ and said that those movie theaters in particular that the studios owned uh, in the downtowns that were the real linchpin of how that whole system worked that they needed to divest of them. And then it, you know, it took a few years for that to take place. And during that time, there's lots of other changes too. Um, when you, th you know, uh, unfortunately, especially you, you think of those independent theater owners who fought and advocated for this for so long. And then as soon as, you know, they actually have the chance, let's say to maybe buy one of those downtown theaters, there's tons of people leaving downtowns, you know, moving yeah. to the suburbs and yeah. uh, baby booms happening, having kids and, and movie going attendance just continues to decline in yeah. the late forties and fifties. Right. The rise of TV and yes. Everything yeah. Else. Television yeah. too. Um, I want to, I want to uh, talk a little about a uh, little bit about Hokum uh, as, as yeah. you, you've, you've, you've used the, the term Hokum a couple times. This is a, this is a technical term used by HL H. Mencken. Uh, in his and and his magazine uh, American Mercury, um, which w there's there's an interesting uh, there's kind of an interesting subcurrent in this in this part of the book uh, about the 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 tension between essentially what we would you know say today uh, good I I, I want to dumb this down as far as possible good movies and bad movies good movies being artistically minded you know kind of a, a adult oriented sort of thing bad movies being you know, a sentimental pablum. Um, and it, it's very interesting to read this section because it feels like it feels like the same arguments that we are having over and over again. I mean, you could you could transport so much of this 
to the current fights, uh, you know, on film Twitter uh, between MCU stands and you know the Martin Scorsese bros, and you know it 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 all feels it all feels like we have we've done it forever. But there was there was a guy named uh, Tamerlane. Uh, I I assume that's an adopted name. Is he is, Tamar Lane? T- Tamar Lane. I, I think. I, oh, I, I, I think. Is, is that his real that's name? His name. He had a, just... he, he, his sister Annabelle Lane would sometimes write. So, I think. Um, I think Lane is what was the name last name he was born with. But I don't know if he went he, if he changed names to Tamara. But I'm glad you brought him up. He's an interesting character. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just assume it was you know because of Timberlane. I mean, it's you know yeah. Uh, there was a historical anyway. Doesn't matter. Uh, he, but he has <laughs> he has a, he there you 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 quote from uh from an interesting thing that he uh he wrote in 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 this regard. He he says basically that you could. You can, you can, we can have it both ways. Here's, here's his quote. The general public has a right to demand hokum entertainment if that is the sort of silent drama it prefers. And judging from the films that are flooding the theaters in the country, the public is getting its belly full. To say, however, that every film must be in accordance with the mentalities of the morons and the nitwits that make up most of our theater audience is nonsense. It is quite possible for an institution to be both popular entertainment and art. That is the point being overlooked and he his his idea was to have kind of a split uh distribution system right where you would have art houses and you would have essentially the 20s equivalent of the multiplex the the you know the general popular entertainment how did that work out yeah right i mean it's um thanks for bringing him up and you you just mentioned film twitter i mean tamar lane would have been amazing on twitter he like uh he published an entire book called what's wrong with the movies uh, and it's just kind of like one snappy diss after another. He has this great line where he says, the photo play is an art without artists. Like, you know, basically arguing that cinema is this incredible artistic form and has so much potential. And it keeps getting wasted precisely on what you said, what what he categorizes as hokum. Um, and he's he's writing all this in the 20s when... Uh, there's this sense of forward movement and possibility uh, in movies. And some of it is is very much being inspired by the work happening abroad uh, in France and especially Germany with German expressionism. Tamar Lane is watching and uh, watching approvingly of films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and, and F.W. Murnau's films and the, the expressive use of lighting and, and um, camera movement uh, and performance in films like that. And basically saying Hollywood should be doing that. Like we have these tremendous resources, we have the talent, we have, you know, the best sound stages and, and camera equipment in the world. And so, um, yeah, he was proposing this this kind of, uh, as you said, a parallel system of distribution and exhibition, um, but also uh, with the idea that there could be more crossover when it comes to the talent themselves, that they might move between making films that are uh, geared toward populist tastes for the masses and more highbrow artistic fare. And um, yeah, isn't it interesting to, to think about that today and, and think about certain figures like uh, Steven Soderbergh, for instance, who've um, made career moves that uh, move kind of in and out of the studio system in, in different ways. Um, so, you know, he was... Tamar Lane, in some ways, was was done in by his timing. Uh, he he was right on time when it came to the twenties with German expressionism and and those influences. But then the the Great Depression hit right after the introduction of sound, and you see a, a movement um, toward a much more cautious approach to to filmmaking um, yeah. in that context. But but yeah, he's he's a great figure to go back to, and I'm glad you brought that up. Like to think about these different ways that those dynamics have played out over time and how they, they still keep coming up. Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, it's just very interesting to look at the way history, you know, what's, what does George Lucas say? History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? Like that's the, that's, that's, that's what we see time and time again. I mean, if you look back to the, uh, you know, mid two thousands when multiplexes across the country upgraded their, uh, their, their projectors, proje- I'm sorry, projection systems to, uh, digital to accommodate 3d. Right. And then right after all this happens, the great recession happens. Right. And, you know, uh, theaters are in trouble a little bit. So what do we do? We retreat back into the kind of more familiar, 
Um, the, this coincides perfectly with the rise of the MCU, the the huge tentpole uh, franchise thing that we have going on now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm talking more than I like to. I, there was one more. Yeah, this, is, one this, more. Is, this is fun to talk about. Yeah, and you're right. The history does rhyme. And uh, I, I, if I can just bring this up, because I, 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 I tell my students about this sometimes. If you remember during that period, Jeffrey Katzenberg's pred- prediction that we would all have like $200 Oakleys that are yes. our 3D glasses that we carry around with us. I don't, I don't know about you, Sonny, but I, I can't find my uh, my 3D Oakleys anymore. I I actually, when this was happening, Jeffrey Katzenberg, look, say what you will about Jeffrey Katzenberg, but that man uh, will talk to anyone who will listen to him. And I know this because at the time I was working at the Washington Times, not the Washington Post, the Washington Times uh, in 2008. Uh, and he was doing a city to city tour touting the wonders of 3D. And I, I got like 30 minutes with him to talk about this. And sure, sure enough, the, we talked about the 3D Oakleys that we would, uh, we would, uh, and I would, I, I would have to get prescription ones. Yeah. Because I wear, you know, I wear glasses. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would have to get my prescription 3D Oakleys. He's like, that's a thing we can do. It, it's a couple <laughs> hundred bucks. So it won't be, a, won't be a problem at all. I'm like, all right, well, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. We'll see. I'll have to get them out for Avatar 2 uh, in that, December. That sounds great. A, lo- a long history of boosterism. There could be a, a whole other book written about that. Yeah. Um, I, the last thing I wanted to, the last big thing I wanted to hit on here was Martin Quigley, uh, who, we, who we mentioned a little bit before, and his involvement with the production code, which I think is a, which I think is a very interesting, and um, I didn't know anything about, frankly. I didn't, I did not know that he, how involved he was with the uh, creation of the production code, and that he was doing it while simultaneously. Uh, running a, a fairly substantial uh, industry trade publication, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, he's he's another fascinating and, and very important figure in, in film history. Um, Quigley got his start in the movie industry, editing a trade paper called Exhibitors Herald, published in Chicago, and it started as a regional trade paper for uh, the exhibitors that were getting their movies from Chicago. So not just based in Chicago, but you know all the way up probably to where I live in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and, and places like that that would use the Chicago Exchange to get their prints. Um, he developed a reputation as a very strong advocate and ally of the independent exhibitor. This is um, in the late teens and early 20s. Uh, he had a, a Midwestern kind of straightforwardness uh, in his presentation that um, he would often contrast to the, the trade papers that were based in New York. Um uh, but as the 1920s went on, he was he was very savvy in terms of cultivating a, a broad network of relationships, and he tried very hard while he was continuing to, you know, advocate for independent exhibitors um, to also um, network and endear himself with the the new Motion Picture Producers and Distributors Association, which was created in 1922 and headed by Will Hayes. And he had a good working relationship with with Will Hayes, um, and seemed to have a good working relationship with the the top distribution executives of the the studios, and he really saw himself as a problem solver, um, and uh, someone who could be a really good mediator for the industry, uh, and he would write um, an editorial page each week, and they were gen- generally geared toward you know some here's some industry problem. And here's a solution. And sometimes they would have kind of a moral righteousness to them, but he was also uh, practical. Um, before he became a trade paper editor, uh, according to Martin Quigley's son, he went into to a seminary for training to, to be a Catholic priest and then changed directions. But he was, um, he was you know, a, a practicing, very religious, um, practicing Catholic, but also really understood um, uh, the Catholic power structure um, and the way that things could get done and how to operate within that structure. And so he became an important mediator and figure in the, the late 1920s in terms of um, communicating between the studio executives and Will Hayes, who's the, the head of the trade organization on, on the one hand, uh, and then um, uh, Catholic bishops and the church and really trying to come up with a constructive uh, approach to movie content that could satisfy everyone, um, or at least really satisfy those groups that could help the producers themselves make more money because, you know, this way their films wouldn't be 
protested um, by advocacy groups. They could pass through state censorship boards in more of a consistent way, and they could hopefully avoid more state censorship laws from being written. Um, but he could also um, instill within the movies uh, a sense of Christian morality that was very important to him. And so uh, Quigley in late 1929 and early 1930 collaborates with a, a St. Louis-based Jesuit priest named Daniel Lord, and they together write the production code. Um, and the previous document that, that um, movie producers have been using uh, was called the Don'ts and Be Carefuls. And, and Quigley and Lord did not like that at all. They didn't want this framed in terms of don't do this, don't do that. Uh, instead, they, they uh, produced a document that um, presented their vision for the, the uplifting nature of entertainment. Uh, and then if you read the, the code, it says tons of like, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> don't, you know, don't show people dancing in too suggestive of a way. Uh, don't show interracial uh, romance. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot that they say don't do and, and a lot that we can take issue with today. Um, but but it, it, it was uh, accepted by the producers in 1930, um, which is just kind of amazing when you think about it, that a, a Chicago trade paper publisher and a, a Jesuit priest go into a room full of producers in, in LA and pitch them on this and it was adopted. Those of you um, out there who are you know, film history buffs will know that the code was not really strictly enforced until 1934. And so when you hear about pre-code Hollywood, um, we're often talking about those sound films that were um, produced before 1934, before Joseph Breen became head of the Production Code Administration and really started to enforce the code in much more of a, a strict way. Um, uh, and what's interesting is that, that during that time, um, the Quigley's mission to try to consolidate all the trade papers, um, he initially had some success doing that. He had bought out some of his rivals, uh, and he was hoping that basically the others would just go away, especially because he had an arrangement with the studios guaranteeing him advertising. Uh, but that's not what happened. And so in, in the book, and especially in the, the later sections of the book, I talk about why that plan to consolidate the trade papers failed. And you brought this up earlier, Sonny, just the way that there were all these different constituencies and, and communities within the industry that would never be satisfied with, with just one publisher trade paper. But what's what's interesting is that Quigley, during that same, you know, like five-year period from 1930 to 1935, when he realizes his plan to, you know, consolidate all the trade papers and essentially have a monopoly has, has failed, um, he's very uh, encouraged to see that the, the production code is finally starting to be um, adopted and, or I should just say implemented in, in more of the consistent way that, that he'd always wanted. And so uh, his, his legacy um, is not so much as the, the unifier of all the, the trade papers and having this monopoly over um, being the voice of, of the industry on the trade paper side, um, but his, his legacy is very much as, as one of the authors of the production code and, and having a, a huge impact on movie content uh, and, you know, publishing a good trade paper, a motion picture herald. You can still go back and, and find all kinds of good things in it. It's just, uh, it wasn't the only game in town. Never, never yeah. was and, and wouldn't uh, remain so. Yeah. Uh, well, that was that was pretty much everything I wanted to ask. Uh, I always like to close these interviews by asking what I should have asked. Uh, if there's if there's anything you think folks should know about uh, the the trade paper wars in the the first half of the uh, 20th century, or 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 anything else about the the film industry that I that I have failed to to ask. Um, no, well, thank, uh, there's there's nothing specifically that I feel like no people should really know this. Other than I would just encourage. Anyone listening who finds any of this interesting to take a look at some of these magazines yourself. And you can do that uh, on the Media History Digital Library's website, mediahistoryproject.org. We have lots of um, digitized uh, magazines that are free to browse through and look at. Uh, we, we scan magazines that are out of copyright. And so they're, you know, they're in the public domain. They're free to look at and explore. And thanks to support from the University of California Press and my institution, 
University of uh, Wisconsin um, here in Madison, I was also able to publish the book in an open access format. So if um, you want to, I'd, I'd love for you to, to order the, the book as a paper copy. But if you want to look through it digitally, you can too, or you can get both. And so the, the book is um, digitally available for free as well on the website, alongside with those trade papers themselves. So yeah, if, if you're uh, interested um, in the book, or even if <laughs> even if you're not, but like there's been something in this interview that just sounds like curious or, or weird or interesting to you, please check us out at mediahistorydigitallibrary.com um, or not dot, mediahistoryproject.org. We are the Media History Digital Library. Uh, and take a look for yourselves and see what stands out to you. Great. Uh, I will link to that in the email that goes out with this uh, podcast. So you can just click on it there. We'll send you, we'll send you right over. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Eric, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, the, the name of the book is Ink Stained Hollywood. Uh, check it out. Uh, I mean, I, again, I downloaded it straight to my uh, Kindle on on uh, via Amazon. So that that if you, I'm sure there are non Amazon ways to get it, but you know, as a as a corporate shill, that's, that's that's usually what I use. That's right. Yeah, you can find it on the University of California Press website too. And thank you, Sonny. It's been a pleasure. Yep. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. Uh, I am culture editor at the Bulwark, and I will be back next week with another episode. See you guys then. Mm-hmm.